record it. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dejin. I also go by DJ. It's nice to see y'all uh, over Zoom, but nonetheless. Uh, yeah, so like Chris said, I've been involved in a lot of the sandbox deployment things. So if you've used like Search NU, or if you've used the Corey Office Hours app, or the Sandbox website, or the Sandbox Coding Challenge, um, or seen any of the projects, uh, I've been like at least somewhat involved in each of them. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how to deploy a project and the various sort of deployment targets that you can have. And uh, hopefully, if you guys have any questions, I can do my best to answer them. Uh, I haven't seen deployment at huge scale in in companies that much, but I did. Uh, I worked for a startup called Alignable, and they had a pretty interesting setup with Docker. And then when I was at GitHub, I got to work with their Kubernetes setup as well. So that was fun. And I could talk a little bit about that if anyone's curious, but I'm going to start sort of from the basics. So yeah, first of all, uh, we just talk really quick about uh, the process of actually going to production. You know, you spend all this time creating your application and then at a certain point you're like, okay, well I actually wanna put it out there. And kind of what I would recommend is always trying to deploy earlier rather than later. Like your app can still be in like a super duper beta phase. Like it's just terrible. You don't actually want anyone to use it. It still makes sense to like put it up somewhere so that you can get used to the process of pushing it out and sort of ironing all the, out all the kinks before it gets uh, too late for that. When we deployed Corey Office Hours, which is the, the Office Hours app that Corey uses for COVID times and maybe in the future as well, we ended up having this crazy crunch time as we tried to get it out like kind of last minute. And so I definitely recommend just like try to put it up. And when you have it in a public URL, then you can show other people, you can show your clients and be like, hey, here's, here's our project. You want to check it out, give some feedback. Anyway, uh, that should be pretty straightforward. So first thing is to sort of establish that there are sort of different types of deployments that you can go for. Um, and sorry, I'm, I'm kind of, I got lost in the slides, but yeah, so there's, there's always going to be a web server. Maybe we should talk about that. So whether, however you choose to deploy it in the end, uh, when you deploy a website, there's got to be some kind of server on the other side that hosts all these files and uh, sends various information to your browser. And so in the end, you know, like what is what is the internet but just other people's computers? And so, you know, when you go to Google, Google's got a computer somewhere and it's going to host uh, all these HTML files and do all this crazy stuff for you. And uh, we can host our own servers. And today I'm going to demo just using my own computer in here uh, in my room and you guys will be able to connect to it as well. So that should be fun. I'm excited for that. So broadly speaking, if we're just talking about websites, there's always going to be an HTML file. So when you go to google.com, when you go to Gmail, anywhere you go, there's always going to be just a, a starting HTML file. And that HTML file can then link out to various other assets like images, styling, and JavaScript for dynamic stuff. And it can also then go and hit various APIs to get data to fill the page with. Uh, and so, right, like the slides say, you know, web servers, they're just computers. They just like stay running and they serve content as, as, as you ask them to. And all right, so next up, I kind of felt like we should draw the distinction between two major styles of deployment and one of the, the core things that if you're gonna take away from this presentation, it would be that the way you deploy is dependent on the way you wrote your application and the needs of your application. Like you writing all this code and putting it up on GitHub and collaborating on it and running it locally, all that is intrinsically tied to actually deploying it. And it's important to think about all of that uh, together. Like if you just write a ton of code and you're like, oh, I guess now we've got to deploy it. Like that'll work. That's actually honestly usually how it goes. But a lot of times you can hit some sort of roadblocks when you do that. And so it's good to think about it a little earlier. So the first thing that I always try to figure out at the very beginning is can this website be static or does it have to be dynamic? And the definitions for that is like a little sketchy, but we will try to get into it. So the way that I kind of want to define static is that it always serves the same thing. So for example, the Oasis website, the Sandbox website, the React documentation, these are all clearly static. Like when you visit those websites, it's always the same content unless they updated it. 
So they could update the content, but everyone gets the same content. So there's like an HTML file and it's just like, here's the HTML file. It doesn't care who you're talking to, like who you are. It's just like, here's the same HTML file. And after you get the HTML file, like JavaScript can do various like dynamic things. But in the end, the core content that the server is pushing out is always the same for everyone. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's a static site. The great thing about static sites and the reason why I always try to think, can this be static at the beginning is because they are so, so, so much easier to deploy. There's a lot of free resources. If you, we're going to, in our demo or interactive um, component today, we're going to have all of you uh, put up a little site using GitHub pages and that's free. It's easy. You literally just click some buttons and then boom, you've got a website. And uh, I'll get into this later, but static sites, are starting to become more and more popular as we're able to use JavaScript to start to beef them up and get them to have a lot more features. So I think we will do a demo real fast. So I think I'm going to share my whole desktop. So does everyone see some, some code stuffs here? So what I've created is a static site demo, and this is literally just a directory on my computer. Again, like a static site is basically just files that we're serving that your browser can then render. And so we've got an index.html. Um, it's just got some HTML in it. And then we've got the Oasis logo in this directory, and we've got a little secrets file we can talk about that later. Um, and so what I've got is essentially uh, what is a web server. But you can think about this as a very dumb web server. It doesn't do any processing. It doesn't do any, it doesn't really run any code. All it does is it says, oh, a browser wanted index.html. Okay, here's index.html. It literally just file, it's like a file server. So uh, I got a little windows open. Everyone could go to this URL. I'm going to put it in the Zoom chat. I will be doing three different demos all at this URL. So if you go to this URL, you'll see this page. Um, if you get to it successfully, could you just put like a yes or something in the chat? Okay, awesome. So you all see Hello Oasis. And to emphasize how simple this is, we can go to oasis.png and it's, you know, it's just a PNG file. It's literally just a file server. And then what I was saying with secrets is if you go to secrets.txt. Oh no, you found my secrets. So uh, my point here is that it's just going to serve this whole folder regardless. Like even though the secrets.txt isn't used at the index, like you don't see the secrets here, it's literally just a file server. We ask for something, it looks at the request and it's like, oh, here you go. Here's that file. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, are there any questions at this point? Uh, not yet. We will we'll not be stealing any passwords today. I should have made my static site like a fake uh, my Northeastern or something. All right, cool. Let's move on. So next up, we can talk about what are dynamic sites. So. I think we're going to define dynamic sites as basically it, it's when the server is going to pull in all this information and send different stuff to you. Uh, it's also it can be known as like server side rendering. A uh, good example is like uh, google.com is server side rendered and dynamic. If you think about like Google Docs, that's super duper dy dynamic. It's like, even though there's a lot of client side rendering, it, it's definitely hitting a lot of APIs, pulling in a lot of data, and it's nothing like you know, a static thing like the Oasis website. Facebook, AnyWorks, all good examples. Um, so this is going to be a little bit more flexible. It's also just going to be a lot more interactive. So we can start to store stuff in a database, expose it via an API, all that type of stuff. And if you want to build like a web app, you are probably going to need to build it as a dynamic site. And so Core Office Hours is dynamic. Uh, search and you is dynamic, you could say, but uh, yeah, it's dynamic because every time you search something, it's like a totally new page. You could search anything you want and it just has to like generate new pages for you. Uh, 
github.com is dynamic. So yeah, this is gonna be more involved. There's less free resources. The reason static sites are always free is because it costs like GitHub basically no money to host GitHub pages. And so they're like, okay, yeah, let's just do it. It's a good business move. But to host like a whole web server that you could potentially launch core office hours, for example, on would cost a lot more money. So yeah, let's do a demo of this one as well. So in this other demo, uh, I've got this dynamic site and we are building a little web server. I just, I literally just found this code on GitHub somewhere and it's just a little to-do list. It doesn't use a database. It's just like storing things in memory, but yeah, let's try that. So dynamic site. Cool. So then now if you go to this, the, that weird URL that I sent earlier and you just refresh the page, we should all be seeing a little to-do list app. I'm going to make this a lot bigger. So if you add a task, we will all be able to see each other's tasks, although you will need to refresh. So if I say, learn about servers, oh, I already wrote that before, add task. Then, oh, I see someone wrote LK, yeah. So uh, anyone can just add tasks and it's like a really poorly made application because you have to keep refreshing, but don't blame me, blame whoever wrote it. I just stole someone's code on GitHub. Cool, I see stuff. Awesome. So I, I could go in a little bit more detail about how this works, but I think you guys get the idea. One of the big things that dynamic sites enable is for multiple users to start interacting with each other, right? Like if you have a static site, everyone's getting the same content. Content can't be updated. And furthermore, like users can't interact with one another because nothing can really change. And so now that we have a dynamic site, we have an actual process running that is updating this task list. And so you, we could see where I, where I ran it, this is a little different now, even though these commands might've looked similar, serve is like just a super dumb little file ser server. And then this is actually running node to actually run a whole bunch of JavaScript code. And there's all these like handlers to do things. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Any questions? Yeah, questions in the chat, greatly appreciated. I'll, I'll see them. You can just throw them in the chat anytime. Cool. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about serverless, but I'm not going to demo it. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, I've done a whole bunch of serverless. It's just like kind of challenging to demo in a way that makes sense. So, right. Serverless is weird because like I said earlier, every website is just a server. It's just like someone's computer talks to your browser and is like, hey, here's some HTML. And so serverless is, it's the very name is kind of just incorrect. Like there is still a server. It's just that you don't have to manage it. So normally the way deploying would work and I can talk about, for example, Cori office hours, the way it's deployed is we go into a little virtual machine that Cori has set up for us. We pull in our code and then we run like yarn start basically, and it runs a process that lives there and can manage those things. The problem is like, we have to manage this virtual machine now. Like we have to install OS updates. We have to do database backups. We have to worry when there's maintenance and it goes down. And then another thing is when, if potentially the load becomes very high, like we get flooded during some assignment is due, a lot of people in office hours, then potentially our server might not be able to handle that. And if we want to, let's say, give the server more resources, we want to give it more RAM, we want to give it another CPU, we have to like turn it off and then restart it. And so like there will just be no coreofficehours.com for a while. And if we get a lot of load and we want to sustain a sort of distributed system where we have multiple web servers running, et cetera, uh, then, then we have to manage multiple virtual machines and it gets, uh, it gets to be a lot of work pretty fast. So there's a new trend of doing serverless, which is where these cloud platforms are gonna manage everything at the infrastructure layer for you. And all you do is you say, hey, here's a function, execute this function whenever someone goes to this URL. And you don't have to worry about like, 
updating your CentOS system. You don't have to worry about there's an outage at your at your uh, at your data center or anything. They're just going to run it. And if you start to get ten thousand requests a second, they will scale to ten thousand requests a second. They'll just run your your function ten thousand times a second because all of these cloud services they can just sort of scale like that. And so this is great. These end up also potentially being cheaper when you don't have a lot of load. If you think about this, when you have a virtual machine, you have to pay for it at every hour of the day, even if you're not getting any web requests. With serverless, they only run your function when you have requests. And so if you only get requests like once a day, they'll just pay per invocation. Uh, and so that, that means that when it's not running, you don't have to pay anything. And you end up you could end up saving money once you start to scale up though uh it can start to get more expensive but at that point you could probably switch over um serverless is a rather new technology if you're working on something important i'm not sure i'd recommend it there's just like a lot of things to work out but for some specific workloads it can be really good if you for example want to have a little service for yourself to resize images which is a rather popular thing uh, for example, if you run a website where users can upload a profile picture and they people start uploading like one gigabyte profile pictures they got right off of their DSLR, uh, you don't want to serve those pictures to all other users because it's going to slow down your website. So you take that one gigabyte image, you shrink it down. That was a perfect use for serverless. You just you write a little function, you put it up on AWS Lambda, and it will resize images for you. So uh, this is starting to also get into where you have sort of hybrid solutions. So when I worked at Alignable, they had web servers running on virtual machines, and then they also had a few serverless functions when it was appropriate and cost effective. Any questions about serverless? Oh, and I forgot about this one, yeah. So you can also get vendor lock-in every Cloud service has their own format for doing serverless functions. And so if you write your whole application on AWS Lambda, and then you decide that like, oh no, Google Cloud is a lot cheaper, we should switch. You're gonna to have to probably rewrite a good bit of it. There are certain frameworks that can abstract, run a layer of abstraction on top, but it can be just kind of a hassle sometimes. Uh, and like the slide says, these these services all get started at low cost. I think most of them will give you, I think, between like a million to 10 million API requests per month for free, which is just like insane. Uh, but once you start to scale past that, it will get very expensive uh, in comparison to running your own virtual machine. So cool. We have now, we've deployed a sample static site, this is a sample dynamic site, and you know, the main difference is that dynamic sites can create pages for us that are different for each person or depending on other conditions, whereas static sites are always just the same HTML file. Something that I don't think I have a slide for, but that I wanted to talk about really quick is this idea of starting to use static sites for more and more things. So I think we can start to push the boundary of like, what is a static site? So I have, just to try to emphasize this a little bit more, We've got another static site here in the demos that is still static. It's still just a bunch of HTML and JavaScript files, but it's going to do a bit more than our old crappy little Hello Oasis thing. So once again, we're just gonna run the serve command and this is just gonna act as a little file server. But this time, if you guys refresh this URL, we're gonna have a little tic-tac-toe game. And so you can just sort of, you can play against yourself. Um, and this is only running on each of our machines. So we can't play tic-tac-toe against one another. That's an important difference, right? Because we need a dynamic site to be able to play against each other. But we are able to play in, in our own little browser. And so with JavaScript, we can start to do a lot more stuff. And what we can also do is if there's APIs that have already been built, by other people or by someone else at the company, you can start to put static sites that hit APIs and start to do really interesting stuff all in JavaScript. And it's still all static because your server isn't doing any additional work. Uh, this is something called, if you want some like further reading, it's client-side rendering versus static site renderings versus 
static site generation. If you just Google, like, let me see, CSR. I'll put it in the chat. These three acronyms, um, they're like the three main ways of, of deploying applications, I think. Uh, or sorry, not deploying, of like structuring the way your application is rendered. So yeah, hopefully that made some sense. And so does everyone see GitHub on my screen right now? GitHub suite or Zoom suite. Yeah, kind of yeah, funky. it's on there. All right, sick. Um, so yeah, if everyone could navigate to this page and there should be just like a couple of buttons. That's how easy static deployments can be. So if you just click this fork button in the top right, um, in my case, I've already done it, but you click fork and then you click on your user. You should say like your GitHub user here and you just click on that. It will go to the forking process. It'll probably bring you to a little spinner. And if y'all could just say like, uh, yes or something in the chat when your spinner finishes and you see a page that looks like this, where it's like, you see this read me, but it's your name up here instead of Northeastern Oasis. And I'll just wait for y'all. Oh, awesome. Um, cool. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So then we can just go to settings and then we scroll all the way down and then oh, back up a little bit. There's a section GitHub pages. And then I've already done it, but you basically should, there should be a button to like enable it. And then it'll ask you what branch, you just say master, there's no other branches. And then root is fine and then you save. And then it will then, you might need to refresh the page, but it'll give you a URL to go to. It, yours is gonna look a little different from mine. It's probably gonna be like your name .github.io. Um, I've just connected GitHub to my own domain. And then if you go to that link, has, have people gotten to the link or is GitHub still like kind of working on things? Sometimes there's like, I got to spin for a bit. Is anyone stuck or are you guys just waiting? Or GitHub, or is everyone lost? Okay, yeah, you go to settings. There's a settings tab all the way on the right, and then you kind of just have to scroll. Oops, you go to settings, and then you just scroll down. Yeah, pages, and then you enable it. Has anyone gotten it to look kind of like this? Okay, perfect. So GitHub page is a static host. So like we did earlier, it's basically a file, file server, except that um, it'll respond to these path requests. And so um, this is not normal, but GitHub page, pages does a little extra work. So it sees the readme.md and it like renders the markdown into HTML automatically, which is cool. Um, and then the bigger thing is if anyone is like stuck, I can help you out later, but I'm going to just get into this really quick. Now that you have this forked on your account, um, if you want, you can basically just like start working with it. You could probably delete most of this stuff, but it's just in here. So in this template, there's like an index HTML file that is blank and you can just like write stuff in it. And so we can go there by doing GH pages template. And there we go, we have this hello in here. And so if I were to edit this file, I'm just gonna edit right on GitHub and say, hello, I am here during the workshop. And we commit, it might take like five minutes, but eventually when we refresh this page, it'll show that as well. So I just like, GitHub Pages is really nice because whenever you push to your branch, it will just update your website in a few minutes. Um, and that's pretty neat, I would say. What's also interesting is I think it's like kind of broken right now, but we can access 
our old, these are the demos that I was showing you guys earlier. So if you went to demos slash static site, it's this old hello is saying the image is off because there's like a, it's being imported at an incorrect path now. And then I think the dash JS one also is broken for other reasons. But um, if we just fix a few things, those could work. So like that whole tic-tac-toe game that we had earlier could be deployed to GitHub pages. However, this dynamic site has no chance of working that to-do list because there's not even index.html here. There's only an index.js and that's gonna run a, a Node.js server, which GitHub pages is not gonna run for you. It's just gonna host the file. So like we could go to dynamic site index.js, but all this would do is it would just give us, the, this is just the server source file. Um, so when we do static host, like it's just, it's not gonna do that for us. It's just gonna be like, oh, here's your file. Um, but yeah, and then GitHub Pages is nice for a lot of things. I have it for my portfolio website. Um, it's pretty neat. If you want to get into more advanced deployments, um, you could probably start a free trial on AWS and like spin up a VM or something and that could be cool. Uh, does anyone need help like getting their pages forked and like set up? If not, I think that's that's all we got.